Hi everybody, this is Kyle Balda and today we're going to try doing a basic walk cycle in 3D uh, in real time. The way that I tend to do it is the layered fashion rather than pose to pose. So I'll be working with individual uh, channels of movement and eventually arriving at the finished poses when it's all said and done. So uh, to get started here, I'm going to do a 24 frame walk cycle. So frames 1 and 25 will be the same pose, but I'm never going to see frame 25. Uh, so I'll be working with it, but eventually we'll we'll turn that off and only see frames 1 through 24. And the first thing that I'm going to do is just try to get an establishment of where the contact frames are and the passing frames. It's good to put the hips down just a little bit and get a little bit of slack in the knees. And then what I can do is just sort of round these numbers. Uh, these numbers don't really mean anything to me personally, so I'm just trying to get something here that I can remember because whatever I do on frames 1 and 25, I'm going to have to do the opposite on frames 13 later. So there's frames 1, here's frames 25, just saving the keyframes. I'm including the up and down movement because I want the feet to be locked on the ground so the pose is already good there. Um, here I'll go ahead and save a keyframe, but I'm going to change the pose. I've got auto key on so the, the keyframes are being saved as I'm moving it. And this should work now, just sort of a cross-country skier type of look. And um, what I'm going to do here, this is just sort of a good thing to remember, is to set the Z translations, the forward and back movement of the leg, uh, to linear. And that's going to be easier to lock the feet down later. I'm going to cycle the curves here. I've got my cycle windows sort of torn off because I'm going to be using them quite a bit. And there we have the first part of the walk cycle. So uh, the next thing to do is just try to figure out when's the passing frame. When is the foot off the ground? Uh, the halfway mark between the two contact frames. And this foot's going forward, so I'm just going to save a keyframe again, just rounding it up. Whatever is happening at frame 7 for one foot is going to be happening at frame 19 for the other foot. And I'm not worried so much about if that's the perfect height or the perfect pose because this is just trying to get some movement down. Um, I always think of it as if you're sculpting or something like that, you're just trying to get the clay on the table right now. You're not really worrying so much about if it's the perfect form and figure of the sculpture. Um, now that I have this worked out, contact frames and passing frames, uh, it's good to go into the hips. So for the hip animation, uh, you can approach it any way that you feel is the most intuitive. For me, when I look at a walk cycle, I see the up and down movement. That's the most obvious type of movement, uh, at least for a character with this type of anatomy. Um, so to establish the up and down movement, I'm going to try to figure out first where that contact frame is here at 13. And what I find is that one or two frames before the contact frame is when the hip is in the high position. So I'm just going to get there and save a keyframe. And whatever is happening at frame 12 is also going to be happening at frame 24 to make the cycle work. Uh, so now, as the foot's gone down on the ground, it's ready to receive the weight of the hips. So I'm just going to pull that down, and now you'll see the first little up and down movement. We can look at the graph editor here to see what the hip curve looks like, and we can cycle that. And in cycling that, we should be able to see a repeating kind of effect. There's a little stutter there, that's because we're playing frames 1 and 25 together. That'll go away when we only play up to 24 frames. So let's just assume that we're happy with this. We can always change it later. Uh, the next thing to do is to think about, that's a little bit of the weight, um, what's happening with the overlap? What's the root of the overlap movement? And here at the contact frame, the hips will probably be rotated back like so. So go ahead and save a keyframe for that. Whatever is going on at frame 13 is also at frame 25. And as the weight falls forward, the hips are going to pivot forward. So you see that falling movement happening. And I think it's good sometimes to get like a little bit of offset between these two. So maybe we'll move that just a little bit further so it's happening after the up and down movement. Got everything cycling now, so we can just see how that looks. And it's really exaggerated, so I'm just going to pull back on that a little bit just by scaling this slightly. Trying 
crap like that. Okay, so I'll leave it like that for now and come back to it later again to see if we need to adjust it. Most likely we will. So the next thing I'm going to do, that's sort of dealing with the weight. The other thing to deal with is the, the locomotion. And in the locomotion, I'm thinking about the swinging of the hips. What is it that's making that foot go forward? And the root of that movement is happening here in the hips. So I'm just going to give it a little bit of a pivot there. And whatever's going on at frame 25 is also going to be here at frame 1. Sorry, vice versa. And at frame 13, I'll have the opposite because the other foot is forward. So minus 15. We can see what that looks like. All right, so you start to see a little bit of what's what the locomotion is behind the walk cycle. And whatever's going on here at the contact frame, we're going to have something happening at the passing frame. And there's a number of ways you can do this. You can always make them go down like so. I want to do something a little bit dynamic and kind of animated uh, feeling. So I'm going to lift the hips up to accentuate the lifting of the foot up. So whatever I have here at frame 7, I'm going to have the opposite here at frame 19, minus 7. <clears throat> and then whatever I have at frame 7 is also going to have to be further on down the cycle. And I've already sort of worked out that that is going to be frame 31. So I'm going to save the keyframe here move that on down to frame 31 and cycle. All right. The last thing here that's really important to do is to think about the weight shift because when the all the weight is on this foot, the hips are going to have to be over that foot and you can start to see that sort of line getting worked out there. So I save the keyframe there. Frame 19, I can do the opposite. And then same type of thing. I want to copy this keyframe and move it on down to frame 31. All right, so everything's really exaggerated. And this isn't a bad time to sort of pull back, make everything else slightly less big. It's good to make it big in the beginning because you can at least see it, see it working, see how it's happening, and then just pull back slightly. About 70% on these. But again, you just sort of feel it. that looks like. So he's a little bit bouncy. Maybe we can pull back on this a little bit. Slightly less up and down movement. Maybe that's too much. Okay, so that's probably good enough for now. We can always come back in and polish up uh, what's going on in the hips, but it's enough information about the movement to let us move now into the feet. Okay, so moving now to the feet. Uh, it's easier just to choose one foot to work with, and then you can copy and paste the animation of one to the other. That's one of the nice things about working on cycles. Um, so I'm going to pick this one because it's in front. And here is where the contact frame is. And I want to get this sort of heel-toe kind of action happening. Um, there's going to be the heel on the ground and the toe up here. But about two frames later is when the foot will be flat on the ground. So I'm going to save a keyframe for that first. And then right at the contact frame, I can do that. I'll fix these intersections later. Um, I'm a more of a fan of sort of the old school rigs. I don't really like the reverse foot too much. It's just a personal preference, uh, but use what what feels good for you. And 
I'm saving the translation in Y and the X here because that's, that feels to me like the last time I'm going to see the foot flat on the ground like that. Now I can lift the heel up. I can rotate the foot. Now there's some advantages to using the reverse foot setup to do this, but those advantages give you some disadvantages in other areas. I just find this to be the lesser of two evils. So there you go. That's the first part, and it doesn't really feel like it's got a lot of thrust to it. And part of what happens here is that once you lift up the foot right there, you lose a little bit of what makes it push off the, the, the heel, push off the ground. So if I grab these curves here and move them back, I can reestablish a little bit of the thrust of the, of the foot there. Then what I also need to do is once the foot's in the air, it's better to give it a little bit of hang time. So what I initially did by using these linear curves here when the foot goes flat on the ground works in that moment, but when the foot's in the air, it doesn't work as much. So I'm going to break these, make them flat tangents like that, and even give the foot a little bit more hang time here in the back. And then it'll swing forward a little bit more quickly. Same thing here with the, the rotation of the heel. Let it even overshoot a little bit. That means we're going to have to fix these so that when we cycle the curves, there's not going to be like a bump right there. Okay, and then it's not even a bad idea in some cases to let the foot overshoot slightly or at least come quite close. Looks like we got two keyframes there. And that also means that the toe can come up a little bit here. All right, so let's see what we got with that. And the main thing now is to try to fix the intersection, and that'll take a little bit more time to do. But before we get into that detail, let's also work on the arc of the foot coming forward here. So I'll bring the foot slightly, slightly in, and these three channels of movement all relate to each other pretty well. They're all sort of dealing with the horizontal movement of the foot. So think of them as a, as a family, as a group. Um, and basically, you can go ahead and save the positions at 1, 13, and 25. Those are all the contact positions. And as it swings forward here, you can swing it out. You can rotate it a little bit like so. And now going back into some of the other channels of movement that have been established, we can start to edit them, make things work a little bit better. This is going to need to be more smooth. OK, so that's sort of working. Still some intersections. Uh, we can fix that with the, the toe movement right there. And then the rest of the intersections will be minor, and I tend to leave those for the very final kind of finessing stage. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to save the keyframe here where the toe should be locked down and then just correcting it. That's all the pressure that's being built up in the toe. And then here, 
a little bit of drag. And then back to zero. Okay, so that feels good enough for now. And it's a good idea to just make sure all of these curves are cycling. Because what we're going to do is copy and paste all the animation from this foot onto this foot. So I'll switch over to the dope sheet. And I'm just going to delete all the animation that I've made for that one foot because I can now copy and paste it. This is the good foot here. There's the foot that's receiving. So the first thing you're going to see is that it looks a little weird because it's exactly the same time. And that's strange. So we're going to offset all the animation on this one by 12 frames. That's half of the cycle. And now there's still a strangeness because of the way that this is rotated. And to fix that, we're going to have to flip the curves. And the curves that we flip are those same ones, the horizontal group. So I can say times equals minus 1, and that should invert the curves like so, giving us this sort of a feel. And now I'm going to leave the lower body and move up to the upper body and get that worked out. Okay, so I haven't gotten pretty far along with the lower body. Uh, it's a good time to move up to the upper body. And it's good to keep in mind also, in, you know, what's the anatomy of the character and the design of the character. This guy's in a space costume, so he's probably not going to be very supple. But what we want to try to do is counter whatever's going on in the hips for the locomotion in the upper part, upper part of the body. So I'm just going to rotate here slightly the chest so that when the right hip is forward, the left shoulder is going to be forward. But that's not coming from the arm. It's coming more from what's going on inside the spine. So I save a keyframe for 1 and 25, just as before, because this is all happening on the contact frames, and then the opposite happens here. Same thing happens, getting some opposition and the Z rotation of the hips and trying to get an opposite type of feeling happening there. And probably even just stabilizing him is going to be OK so he doesn't feel too overly loose. But again, that depends a lot on what the style of the character is. So taking a look here in the graph editor, same type of thing. Copy and paste this keyframe here and send it off onto frame 31. Now we can grab all these curves. and we can cycle them. I've lost my cycle windows, so I'm going to have to open them up again. OK, there we go. <clears throat> I'll just move those out of the way. And he feels a little bit too big in the Z rotation. So I'm just going to come back on that a little bit. All right. And we'll do a little bit of overlap. A little goes a long way, so try not to overdo it. Basically, as he's falling forward, just a little bit of drag in the spine. As he's coming backwards, pulling forward like so. 
And if you want an easy way to find out how to make that cycle complete, one way to do it, I'm just going to remember that this is at frame 10. Bring this all back here to frame 1. So whatever is happening here at frame 1 would also happen at frame 13. Now I can bring this back to frame 10. It's always good to check just by checking that frames 1 and 25 are the same. So when you go back and forth between 1 and 25, there should be no change happening on screen. So there's a little bit of overlap. And now it's probably a good time to just change that to 24 just so you can see how it feels without playing 25, which is the same frame as, as frame 1, so you're not going to see the same frame twice. Okay. <clears throat> now going into the head, this should be very, very simple. I just want to correct him so that he's looking forward. Like that, four. Same, same thing at frame 25. Back to 13, minus four. And I'm probably not going to do too much of the Z, maybe not at all, just because it starts to feel a little bit too too fluid for a spacesuit. But probably can do a slight amount of overlap with the head. Same thing, so as it's going up, I'm just going to drag the head down a little bit. Whatever's going on at frame 11 will also be at frame 23, pretty sure. And then as he's dropping down there, a little bit of drag on the head. We'll see how that looks. And it's probably just a little bit too much. Let's go back up. Okay, so that's the spine. The last thing to do here, before we've gone through everything, is a little bit of work on the arms. And just like the feet, it's not necessary to do both. We'll just do one and then we can copy and paste. And I'm just going to accentuate the movement that's already working there. Find the forward and back. There it is. And just go a little bit further with the opposite so if that foot is there, is forward, this arm is going to be forward at the contact frame. Frame 13, just bring it back slightly. Now we've got a little bit of arm swinging. Work down the hierarchy so that we can see what it feels like if the elbow bends. and then it will straighten. It'll stay straight. And we can just try to figure out what that would look like in the cycle. Same technique here. This is frame six, so I'll try to remember that. And I'll just copy whatever it is here, to frame 25. And then I can move this back to frame 6, offsetting this whole cycle and cycling it, giving us that feeling of drag. I don't like this ever being too flat, just keeping things moving a little bit, even if it's just the slightest little push. We're probably not going to see too much of a difference. And maybe I can make this all a little bit straighter. Okay. 
and I can finally go into the wrist. And work a little bit on the overlap here. So as he's moving forward, a little bit after he started moving forward, give a slight amount of drag to the wrist. And the opposite there. So that's frame nine. And I'm gonna to try to remember that as I bring all this back to frame one. and paste, go back to frame 9, and cycle it. And that just feels a little bit too soft. All right, so the easiest thing here to do is to copy and paste all of these controls onto all of these controls. And that's what's good for the dope sheet. First, I want to make sure everything is cycled. And then I can switch over to the dope sheet, copy, and select these, and paste. Same type of thing as before. I have to offset all of these curves by half of the cycle. It's 12 frames. And basically we've gone through all the channels that we can. And I often think of it as like, a rock band going into the studio and each band member is laying down the tracks, the bass, the guitar. And after everything's recorded, you can go in and do the remix, try to mix it correctly. And the mix is going to happen on all the different channels here that we see in the graph editor. And that'll probably take about as much time to do as this took. But that's the basic idea of how to get a walk cycle working in real time. <laughs>